The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. again it's his show it's brandon i'm very excited to bring you the brandon peter show this week and for many reasons we'll get into shortly but perhaps the biggest reason is my guest whom i'll be discussing charlie chaplin's 1940 film the great dictator with the director and filmmaker and artist of the award-winning short film storm chaser gretel claggett Hey, Brandon. <laughs> well, welcome back. Thank you. To the show. <laughs> so welcome to this week. Wednesday this week is my birthday. We're Happy also birthday. Thank you. We're also <laughs> inaugurating a brand new president of the day. But most exciting, this great dictator episode is finally happening. And I think the episode sort of wanted to be this week and fought its way because this is not the first time. Gretel and I are going to talk about everything happening on this episode. Uh, Unfortunately, my laptop's hard drive kicked the curb when I was editing her last appearance on the show back in back when we recorded in 2020. In in 2020, it was actually we spoke on December 28th, 2020, which feels like years ago now. It does. That's why. Why why is it like that nowadays? Like I don't know, but it's it's crazy. But yeah, and I too, I mean, I, I'm so happy that you wanted to bring that up that we had talked before because oh, yes. <laughs> we had such a great conversation and we're just talking about how the great dictator was so relevant and <laughs> any of the things that we talked about were so relevant and yeah. timely and they've become even more timely. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. We literally, two weeks ago from right now, we're recording this on the 11th of January. It's dropping on the 18th. Exactly two weeks to the day since we last recorded, and it's been five years, and the world is a different place. Insanity. Like, how does that happen? But that's what the way the whole past almost year has been, because I think 2020 really starts in like March or February, end of February, March, and then it's still going now. So- we should change New Year's to right, March. and uh, maybe after after your birthday and the inauguration <laughs> next Wednesday, right. then it will be twenty twenty one. Although I think right. that twenty twenty one is basically saying, "Oh, you think twenty twenty? Well, wait a minute, you haven't right. seen twenty twenty one. It's like I'm going to compete with twenty twenty, and that's what like twenty sixteen did, uh, twenty seventeen did to twenty sixteen, and those like it's like get us out." <laughs> Well, hopefully, I mean, hopefully things will get better, hopefully, Mm -hmm. but it just seems that the volume just keeps turning up, 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 you know, it's like, it's like spinal tap, you know, this one goes to 11. No, it goes to 11. (laughs) You know, 2021 goes to 11. (laughs) Sadly, our recording right now, when it drops, when you're listening to it on the 18th, it's quite possibly very dated. More stuff could have happened. That's true. That's true. I don't like it. I'm just stating the not. facts. I, I hope, hope not. I but... hope our FBI and National Guard and people are able to not let things happen over the course of the next week and weekend leading up to the 18th. And it's just like these people be crazy, and they're you know they're paying too much attention to that news, and we were way off. But oh man, this this could be like a dated conversation. It's crazy. It, our last one already is. I know it and is. No one can hear it. Anyways. Only you and I know about that. But <laughs> right, <sighs> right. And it's funny, even with Storm Chaser, what I started hearing even more. I mean, of course, that phrase, a storm is coming, a storm mm-hmm. is brewing. I mean, that has been used before, but I really heard that spoken a lot about last Wednesday. And, you know, and they were saying the storm is coming. The storm is coming. Now, Mm -hmm. of course, Storm Chaser is not associated with that storm. It is in a sense, but it's not. (laughs) 
Yeah. Um, if you know what I mean, right. but, but, but it is interesting. I think that the fates decided that we had to have this conversation. They did now and to bring it up to date. No, they totally did. It's, yeah. it's just insane, which let's, let's get right into storm chaser, your film, the reason we are connected right now. And it stars Mary Birdsong, Dominic Reigns and Stephen Plunkett. And do you want to tell people what it's about? Like the general synopsis? Oh, sure, sure. So if you're not tired of doing so, (laughs) not just with me, I'm sure you've had to tell, you know, be like, well, Storm Chaser. Exactly, exactly. What is Storm Chaser about? It's basically about a woman who always wanted to just chase tornadoes with her dad because Mm -hmm. that's what made her feel alive and connected to Mother Nature. And so we see a little bit of that at the beginning of the film. And then we meet her in midlife and she's up against a recession. She's struggling to make ends meet, as so many people are today. And instead of chasing tornadoes, her passion, she's stuck in this joyless job selling roofing, siding and storm doors for a very kind of a fly by night operation flip siding with this guy, Flip Smith, who maybe will remind you of a leader on the world stage today, who I'm sure we'll be talking about. And basically, in creating this film, I mean, I was fascinated by the metaphor of a storm. I grew up in the Midwest in Tornado Alley. So of course, I grew up with tornadoes. And uh, I didn't ever actually chase tornadoes. But what I discovered in writing the film was that Yes, storm chasers are people who are passionate about chasing tornadoes, but it's also a derogatory term for someone like an ambulance chaser. They call these, typically they're guys who go door to door and they're selling roofing, siding and storm doors for shady operations that make cheap materials. And really it's disaster capitalism. So that's what Mary Bird song playing Bonnie Blue, that's the joyless job that she's stuck in. And she's really not very good at it, but she's got to make a living. And so it really is an allegory of a lot of things. I mean, it deals with a lot of things, disaster capitalism. It deals with climate change, global warming, ageism, sexism, racism, definitely a divided America, a shrinking middle class, a bully. You cover a lot. Yeah. And, oh and at the at the heart of the story, really, her character has to make a moral decision. Right. Is she going to take the money or is she going to take a stand and mm-hmm. do the right thing? Now, I've got a couple things around all of what you just said. For what the all the topics that you cover in this, it's not like you're like beating everybody over the head of them. People probably can miss a couple if they're they're watching. Yes. How many of them were calculated and how many of them, when you stood back from the script, did you just go, oh, crap, that just came out of me? I started kind of with that core of the metaphor of the storm. The genesis, I'm a poet Mm -hmm. also, as well as a, a screenplay writer. And so this is based on a poem from my book of poetry, Monsoon Solo, Voices Once Submerged. The poem is called Storm Secrets. Don Stuckey, whom Dominic Reigns plays, was actually in the poem, was the storm chaser. When I started writing the script, I decided at a certain point to gender flip. And so Bonnie Blue, played by the wonderful, fabulous Mary Birdsong, all the actors are just amazingly talented and, and really embodied the roles impeccably. I did a number of drafts and really liked having a female protagonist, especially you normally would not see a woman selling roofing, siding and storm doors door to door. Mm-hmm. You know, it's typically men. So I started with the metaphor of the storm and, and really tackling disaster capitalism, mm-hmm. because that was kind of the hook for me is this predatory capitalism. It happens, of course, with natural during Hurricane Katrina, for instance. Right. There were storm chasers down there, storm chasers of the uh, variety of selling you a roof that's going to blow off in the anytime next Anytime there's hail. Anytime there's hail. Those anytime people. there's hail. Also, another big scam is telling you that your insurance will more than likely cover it. Right. But really leading you to believe that the insurance will. And then, of course, like during Katrina, it was flood versus wind or wind versus mm-hmm. water. And so, you know, people spend a lot of money. And then all of a sudden they realize that 
insurance isn't going to cover it yeah. because it was water damage or it was wind damage, you know, whatever. So disaster capitalism and global warming were kind of at the center. And then from there, as I kept doing rewrites and moving into casting and, you know, the evolution of the process, I really decided like, oh, I want Don Stuckey. You know, he's a guy who's stuck in his joyless job, but I really want him to be a person of color, you know, a brown man in a white man's world. Right. We were very lucky to get the very talented Dominic Reigns. I was very clear also with the Bonnie Blue character. I mean, she had to be kind of beaten up by life. So she had mm-hmm. to be a woman of a certain age. Yeah. Hollywood would probably cast that role with a 20 something, maybe early 30s. But they, um, put, but they put glasses on her. So it's <laughs> exactly. And she exactly. wears a flannel shirt that looks like fashion level, but. Right, yeah. right. Like Daryl Hannah in Steel Magnolias, you know, mm-hmm. she got a lot of raves because they put glasses on her and oh, she was willing to be ugly. Right? So yeah, these other things then just started. And, and I definitely, you know, funny because of now our interview and everything, and here we are in the moment. I really try to do that a lot of times with mm-hmm. my projects, whether it is poetry or screenplay or or whatever I'm working on. I have that core element, but then I definitely am always looking at the larger backdrop of the story. There's a very personal story, but there's always that world and that universe informing it. So In Storm Chaser, as you probably recall from seeing the film and also from our previous conversation, I mean, I literally gave Flip Smith, who's brilliantly played by Stephen Plunkett, Mm -hmm. five verbatims from Donald Trump. Right. I mean, literally five things that Donald Trump has said. Now, Plunkett is such an amazing actor, and he's not playing it that way. And I think what's incredible about his performance is he's always playing the positive, mm-hmm. even though he's the boss that you hope you never have. Right. And we all probably have had at one time or another. I've worked you know, retail, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that sometimes, you know, some people have caught those things and sometimes they don't. They don't Mm -hmm. catch it, but it's there. I think that's the fun thing about creating worlds and about storytelling is Mm -hmm. that you can kind of pull these little nuances of the time. And yet I do think that even though Storm Chaser is timely and I did it as an allegory to really bring up some tough issues that we're facing today, I hope that it will stand the test of time for a while. I don't think it's so of the moment that it's not something that doesn't inform human nature and abuse of power and predatory capitalism. I, I'm not sure how quickly those things will be eradicated. Right. Whether they're in governmental power or in business power or yep. parents club soccer league power, they're going to show up. Like it, it's, it's, exactly. a, it's, a, it's a through line personality that we have not been able to educate, fix, people are people and some people just want that person they look to that person they want to because they could never be that but they that person makes them believe they can or something but it's a i don't know those people can be used in positive things maybe but we never see them that way like it's i don't think that america always did this but i i do feel like for a number of years now not just in the last four years but for a number of years there has been kind of a glorification of bad behavior Yeah. Or no unaccountability for your actions or just well, well, true that. Right. Considering we have I mean, we have a social media Internet atmosphere where you can just be a avatar and say, throw what you want. It's now leaked into doing that in person to person interaction. And that's just not it's not how it floats. And the things happen with that. You don't just get blocked by a user on a on an app. You have and you know, know, freedom of speech, but that's not what it is. But yeah, that's kind of where we're kind of facing with it gave people the courage to type these things to another human or what they think is another human. And then they're like, I'll just display it in the real world. And it's, it's not how human to human works. Well, and even and even with leaders, just a sense of integrity of of our words and actions matching. I think that we are at a very critical juncture as a human race and certainly in our country. Right. You yeah, know? definitely. Definitely. I don't know. Did we did we not pay too much we didn't pay close enough attention to the internet or how like that was informing us or you know. Well, I think that's I, I think that, that is that is true. And 
Well, I'm old enough to remember kind of before the internet. Right. <laughs> and when it came along, and I remember saying to people actually, because I've done a lot of kind of shadow work in healing right. work, and and I, I do really believe in Jungian principles in terms of our displacing the shadow and objectifying, and mm-hmm. and our shadow is really where our power is but we have to kind of own it and integrate it. Right. And so I do remember saying like, this thing has a shadow side that we can't even fathom Mm -hmm. because everything has a shadow side. So I think that, yeah, I think that we did neglect a lot. There have been a lot of things neglected, including public services. I mean, Mm -hmm. let's just healthcare and education and infrastructure that because we've glorified kind of these privatization of things and and people mm-hmm. becoming billionaires and you know we have a whole level of feudalistic capitalism really right and there's a, i mean there's a lot of I, I don't know the good chunk of the portion of the people that are it used to be like well if it's on tv it must be true now it's like if it's on the internet it must and yeah. being a person who and a lot of people like i i want to think people think like me but like having been you know being a writer and stuff you're you know people can make shit up all the time. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> like, I, so you're very I, careful. I, I, to, to, go, to go to our other, not that we're going to get into the great dictator, but I mean, <laughs> Adolf Hitler in Mein mm-hmm. Kampf said, yeah. the bigger the lie, the more people will believe it. Mm-hmm. And all you have to do is repeat a lie over and over and over again. And you mm-hmm. keep repeating that lie and people will begin to believe it. Right. So none of what's happening in our world today and none of the issues that I kind of grapple with in a satiric way, really, mm-hmm. in, in Storm Chaser, that was another thing that I yeah. I was very intentional in writing the script, that I wanted it to not hit people over the head, that I wanted to tell a story with nuance and also humor. I wanted right. there to be things that you could laugh about. Whereas the, the thing know. of somebody thinking the salesman wants to help them, it's like, they want the sale first and right. we'll see about the help. But Right. Yeah. yeah. But all of these things, I mean, they've been going on for forever. Tales all this time. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so I think that what we're going through right now is that storm, that internal and that external mm-hmm. storm that really is a part of Storm Chaser. There's an internal storm and there's an external storm. Yeah. And we all have to kind of make decision, right? Like, Mm -hmm. who do we want to be? And how do we want to create a new chapter, a new phase? Right. Well, I I think Bonnie Bonnie Blue in Storm Chaser, like, I want to feel like she entered the flip company thinking she would help people instead, and then found it's, that's not the, that's not the goal. Yes. I'll share a little backstory with you, you know, in terms of how I thought she entered. I mean, because it's not a part of the film, but Mary and I talked about the fact that well, I don't, I'm not going to share the whole backstory, but all these things yeah. that lead yeah. up to, you know, many, many things that lead her up to this moment mm-hmm. that we discussed. But she saw an ad in a paper for a storm chaser, and she thought it was to actually go chase storms. <laughs> ah. She shows up at this company, flip siding, and, you know, with all these yeah. guys, and, right. you know, and she needs a job desperately. And so Flip gives her a chance because Flip needs to make his quota. He's got Don Stuckey. He's got his person of color, but he doesn't have a woman. So he needs a woman. So he hires her. (laughs) And so she thought she was actually going to be chasing storms. Then she realizes, oh, I'm selling storm supplies door to door. So I agree with you. She doesn't go into it with nefarious intentions. And certainly kind of from scene one, she's kind of like, what's going on here? Like, you know, people Mm -hmm. are saying, products are cheap and there are questionable things, but like all of us who are sometimes thrust into situations where we need to make a living, we want to do well, we want to succeed and there's stuff going around and we're kind of quietly, uh, unconsciously complicit. Right. And it's like something doesn't quite sit well, but it's like, oh, well, he he probably didn't mean that or, oh, that I'm sure that was just a one-off situation. But then, of course, as time goes on, it becomes clear that right. 
a pattern going on. And there is a line in the film where she says, I don't care how poor I am, I'm not going to cheat honest people, which I'm not giving that away. I think that's also in the trailer. <laughs> so, but even with making that choice, she's not perfect. I, I feel like she goes through this whole thing of like, oh, well, this is what it is. And then maybe like, I can, maybe I can make a difference or maybe I have to do it their way. And then maybe then she comes to her crossroads. Like it's like she... It's like a whole whirlwind of things people have in jobs, relationships, all sorts of things. And it's culminated perfectly in like less than a half hour. Like it is. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and speed, speed of, you also have another cut of it called Flip the Switch. Yes. Where you, where you re-edit, you got it down to like 14 minutes. Same, same A to B, but kind of a different experience in the same it's amazing because i we talked this last time but i want to bring it up again because i think it's fascinating because i always you know you always hear we found this in the editing room or we saved this film in the editing room this one didn't need saved in the editing room but you found a different you can find different ways to tell something just all this footage shot scenes were in a script one way throw it a different way what was your motivation to do it shorter or make another cut well, first of all, I had so many people telling me that I was insane for making a short film that was 27 minutes. It's 2712. And it will never get into any festivals. What are you thinking? This is a waste of money. It's like, what are you doing? And my first film, Happy Hour, was 14 minutes. Storm Chaser, of course, the script in my mind, the story needed a longer period of time to tell it the way mm -hmm. that I wanted to tell it. I also wanted to make it as a proof of concept pilot because I do think that the material is rich for further development, which I've started doing, and to also as a writer-director to show that I have the chops to direct longer form content. Obviously, I'll be tackling a feature at some point, but I could do Storm Chaser. I would have had to wait a couple more years to do a feature. At right. that, funding wise, everything, time wise. I actually left a big agency job where I was a senior creative director. So mm -hmm. I was working full time, writing well into the night, writing on weekends, living a double, triple life as yeah. I have for years to make a living and to practice the arts. When I decided to do Flip the Switch, it was really like, well, you know, Storm Chaser was starting to get some festival play, but I really didn't know. Now it did kind of take off and we've been selected at more than 45 festivals. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm very grateful. The film has gotten a lot of honors and awards in multiple departments. So it just goes to show like, don't always listen, hold on to your creative vision. And if you really feel that something's right, that was a big learning for me. It doesn't mean not to listen and be open because it's the collaborative process, but I really cut the film as an exercise and also to give it another avenue because there were certain festivals that said to me, hey, we love this, but there's no way we can program this long of a narrative short. It's just not going to be possible. So I started thinking, well, let me see if I can go back in with my editor, Emily Chow, who's amazing. And let's see if we can get this down to roughly 15 minutes. And it comes in at 1451. Mm -hmm. I learned so much as a writer and director because, yeah, I mean, the pacing, the structure, I mean, scenes are moved around. Right. And like you said, it, it kind of starts and ends in the same places, mm -hmm. but the character arcs and I think some of the scenes even maybe take on a slightly different. No, definitely. Movie. But it still works within the context of, I mean, obviously there's a lot of textural things. I had to kill a lot of darlings, as they say. <laughs> the romantic subplot's gone from the flip the switch. Yeah, it's 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 hinted now it's rather than hinted, but yeah, most of that's gone. You know, there's some other kind of funny moments that are gone. Mm -hmm. I like when you you took the first the adult introduction to Bonnie Blue and you moved it later in the film and it takes on two completely it's like two completely different characters in different times of their life and it's I'm just fascinated by that one little movement and I think there's yes. completely different uh, motivation there and because one introduces us to a different person than the person we see later going to it and it kind of kicks into that final decision a little more and I was just I thought that change was just like I, I don't know which is better but I'm just fascinated by it's two completely different reads 
definitely that scene has very different reads. And I think mm-hmm. the Bonnie selling the housewife. Yes, also, yes. It, yeah, actually. Yes. Too. Yeah. There's, that, it's, a little that is, it's it's funny because some people are big fans of Storm Chaser and you're seeing both films say like, oh, but I still like, no, I love Storm Chaser. And mm-hmm. then I've had some people who prefer Flip the Switch. I mean, it definitely is, you know, They're it's impatient. More, it's yes. Well, it's more of a traditional. I think it's more of a traditional short film mm-hmm. in terms of the short films that we're used to seeing in America, especially. Right. Whereas Storm Chaser feels maybe more like a feature length or a TV pilot, like the pacing. I think short films now we're just used to like boom, 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 boom. And I don't feel that Storm Chaser drags. I mean, of course, I could probably now go in and say like, oh, I could cut a little there, I could cut a little there, but Mm -hmm. they're completely different films in many ways. It was a fascinating experience and flip the switch. It's going to be in Mexico at Oaxaca Festival in June. And it's got a couple of festivals under its belt. And Storm Chaser is now in the New York Women in Film and Television. Oh, okay. Okay. And Um, you you have already won the AMC Networks along with the Sterable Fest 2020, the winner of the inaugural Best Female Creator which I'm going to redub the Gretel Claggett Award from here on oh. out. Since you're first, you're first, they should they get, should give it that name. Yeah. <laughs> that was really cool and unexpected. I was just excited to be among the nominees. So yeah. when I actually won the award, I was kind of blown away because AMC Networks, I mean, Mad Men was like a pivotal part of my television experience. You know, I vivid vividly remember that show and being addicted to that show and yeah. just being just blown away artistically. I mean, at that time, I didn't really have, I was writing. I mean, I've always been writing, but I didn't really at that time have aspirations to direct television or films. I, mm-hmm. I always loved film and television, but right. my career path has been interesting. <laughs> It's been, and of course, Breaking Bad. And I mean, they've done, you know, in The Walking Dead. I mean, AMC Networks is, I think that they are definitely ground breakers in terms of what TV has become, really. I think that then kicked off, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of this great television that we now have today that I want to be a part of. Speaking of, uh, you know, you proof a concept pilot. Storm Chaser, is it, is Storm Chaser, if it were to like go to a series, would it be that would that short film be extended as a season or would it follow after would it be a pilot pilot where that's the first episode? Well, I've kind of played with it a couple of different ways where it would mm-hmm. be the pilot and season one would follow after, but maybe we would play back and forth with time as okay. well because we do have the younger Bonnie storyline right. and we do have kind of that flashback in Mm -hmm. Storm Chaser. So I think it could open up and I always love playing with time or so I thought about it as a novelistic anthology where kind of like a true detective or actually more so in the line of Fargo, right? Um, Where, you know, season one would be Bonnie Blue, Flip Smith, Don Stuckey, the world of Storm Chaser. And then season two would be another metaphorical realm of disaster capitalism. So disaster for capitalism, predatory capitalism would be the through line. I've also uh, played with it in terms of being more of a short story anthology, like mm, trying to think like a little America or Black Mirror. Okay. Different genre than Black Mirror, but right. you know, <laughs> you have a very different genre, but but you have that theme. It's all of the stories are integrated with a theme that runs through, you know, for instance, Fargo, it's always this is based on, you know, this is a a true story and mm-hmm. it's all there's violence and there's someone feels done wrong by and so they're gonna get revenge and they have a simple plan that turns mm-hmm. more okay, violent yeah. than they could ever imagine right and it gets right. out of control and and as opposed to one person dying you know yeah <laughs> tens <laughs> of people die and i i like that i mean those are hard to sell honestly so we'll see i mean i'm very patient with this stuff i'm not a very patient person but i've learned with maturing i've learned to be more patient and mm-hmm. i'm working on some other projects right now developing writing and developing gotcha. so i just feel like if it's meant to expand out i'm very open 
I can see it going a number of different directions. Okay. Um, yeah. And I've, and I've played out other storylines for those other world, the world of the prison, the world of education, the world mm-hmm. of the military complex, et cetera, et cetera, where there's predatory capitalism going on. Gotcha. And, and essentially it's people like all of us. I mean, all of us are a part of the system. And even if we're trying to do the right thing, mm-hmm. the system, and I think that's what we're realizing with Things like the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, the pandemic, the fact that that's hit communities of color harder. We're realizing the systemic nature of some of these problems and and abuse of power Mm -hmm. within the system. And we're all caught up in it. And that's really what Storm Chaser at its heart is about. When you're caught up in a system, even if you're trying to do the right thing, sometimes you end up doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Right. It can get the best person (laughs) in the worst moment. Yeah. And how do we rectify that? Very complex issues that um, I try not to tie things up with a bow. And yet, hopefully it gives you a catharsis and there is kind of a somewhat of a closure. But I think it's kind of left open, too. Before we go to the great dictator, I do want to talk your short film before Happy Hour. Which yes. stars Aaron Ruth and is narrated by Academy Award winner Julianne Moore. Also, something that comes from a poem, mm-hmm. which poetry came from you first, and then you, you know, filmmaker. But do do how hard is it to catch something from a poem? This one is very personal to you, but like Storm Chaser, like from a yeah. poem. But is that where you like to start? Is that just ha- happening now, or that just happened with these two projects? Mm-hmm. Uh, this other two other projects I'm working on right now. Well, actually I'm working on three different projects right now, writing and developing. And none of those came from poems, but happy hour. I would perform my poetry a lot back during that time where my book came out, my, my Mm -hmm. book poetry came out and people always would come up to me after doing a reading and when I would read happy hour, I mean, there would be gasps in the audience and people would come up to me and tell me their stories. And so, yeah, I just decided to make a film and I learned a lot doing it. And that film is actually structured so that the poem, which is a nine, I think it's nine lines, okay. lyric poem is at the end and spoken right. beautifully by Julianne Moore. And we kind of see the story, which is uses a lot of horror tropes. And I know you're a big horror guy, you know, in terms of that kind of uh, yeah. iconic kind of Hitchcockian tropes. It really has some strong visual styles going on and it. it's pretty intoxicating to just take in and look at. Thank you. So. Thank you. Yeah. And it, it's mostly a silent film. I mean, there's some music and some kind of low drone effects. And I actually wrote the script when I finally kind of figured out how I was going to tell the story that would culminate in the poem mm-hmm. being spoken in a voiceover with your seeing things, images from fragmented from the poem. When people would have to speak, I would give them uh, every line had to have a key word or a phrase from the poem. So that's kind of subconsciously in there that I don't think people super catch. clever. I never, I didn't ca- catch it till you told me that. I was like, oh, that's brilliant. And I feel dumb for not catching it. No, no. It's like, <laughs> but then you don't know the poem to the end. So you don't know the poem until the end. But in my mind, it, if anyone spoke, it had to be with something that would resonate at the end. Mm-hmm. And I, I do really believe in the power of energy. Filmmaking to me is very shamanistic, I guess, in a way, you know, mm-hmm. it's very like, I mean, if you think about it, the powerful visuals, the sound, the, you know, you take people into this world and you really take them on a trip, you know, right. hopefully, right? And hopefully there is transformation in that trip that they go on. And because the the subject matter of happy hour is sexual abuse, memories of sexual abuse, complicity Mm -hmm. and grooming, and I deal with unconscious and conscious complicity. And I wanted to bring people into something that was very kind of beautiful and alluring, this world that all of a sudden then becomes more and more, you know, it's a real life horror story. And a lot about how our memories, a survivor's memory can be triggered very easily. Right, right. a traumatic event. So sound, I mean, I'm a big sound, you know, I just, I love sound design. You recommended I put my headphones on to listen to it. I did. And there's nice little sneaky and. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. 
Yeah. And there's a lot of kind of that low drone, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we definitely, um, or the clock with the aunt who walks up the stairs uh, that to me feels very Hitchcock. I mean, we were really going for some of those beautiful kind of psychological horror type shots and, right, and, yeah. and that atmosphere. I mean, I did Happy Hour for a very, for a very, very low budget. They had no money, mm-hmm. uh, begged and borrowed favors. But I think that it, it holds up pretty well. And it definitely is more lyrical and experimental than Storm Chaser. Storm Chaser is much more... Um, of a more of a traditional narrative, but right. still has those kind of leaps of magical realism, if you want to call it. Even though I came to filmmaking late in life, I mean, one of the things, and we'll talk about this with The Great Dictator, I mean, I grew up watching great films because my dad collected 16 millimeter films. Right. So I grew up watching like all of the classics, you know, on a big screen. Mm-hmm. And then I started acting when I was seven in professional summer stock. So that language of storytelling and and cinema, it's so funny how life works. I mean, I remember when I first started writing poems, I showed a friend of mine who was working in television production as a coordinator at the mm-hmm. time. I showed her some of my poems. She wanted to see some of my poems and she was reading them and she said, Gretel, you should be writing for television. This uh-huh. is great. This is like, this. I mean, you could write scripts for television because- right. It was very, you know, there was dialogue in my poems. There was definitely metaphor, visuals, you know, scenes, because I was kind of taking from theater and all of this. But at the time, I just, we all come to things when we're meant to come to them. But I definitely had a foundation for the language of cinema, I think, just engendered from from my dad, my dad's influence on me with films. And then my mom was a semi-professional actress in summer repertory theater. And so I started acting when I was like seven years old and I was around Mm -hmm. actors from New York and California who would come into this little town in Missouri and do professional summer stock. So it was, I was always living, eating, sleeping, breathing stories from a very early age. Happy hours that you said, is it still, you said it was on Amazon maybe or... It's on, yeah, you can get Happy Hour um, on Amazon or mm-hmm. on uh, iTunes. iTunes. And I think it's like two ninety nine dollars to buy it. It's roughly 14, 14 minutes. And all proceeds go to a few organizations that actually help survivors of uh, sexual abuse and their families, as well as an organization that teaches kind of prevention to teachers and to parents of kindergarten age students and elementary school, because sadly, oftentimes that's when these things are going on. Yeah. And I promise if you watch it, it won't hurt too badly. No. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Like I, if I, you know, would have known you or been researching to come this, if I would have saw this just on my own, I would have been immediately like, who the hell made this? And I need to like, I want to watch other things from the, like it's got a lot, it shows a lot of your potential, shows a lot of your skill and talent. And then it's a powerful story and it translates in all sorts of elements of like watch film watching. Like you're just, you know, technically it's great. Storyline is great. Lyrically it's great. So thank you. I mean, and, and it probably will be a subject matter that I, deal with again in a in a different way than happy hour because i think it is something that as the society we still have a hard time talking about and and looking at but i don't i i never want to tackle these things in a salacious way or in mm-hmm. a way that just people get really freaked out about this stuff but it really isn't about the sex it really is about abuse of power which mm-hmm. is One of my major themes, because that's also in Storm Chaser. There are certain themes that I think run through my work, even though Storm Chaser is a very different film than Happy Hour. There's somewhat of a consistent voice, I think, Mm -hmm. in the two, even though they're different, very different. Oh, no, it's, yeah, there's there's definitely, you're building, you're building, we have your whole library of things is going to be like, oh, well, this is where she started tackling this, but it was back here. <laughs> well, actually, she first tackled it back here in Happy Hour. You didn't see Happy Hour? Oh, man. Let me <laughs> let me pull that out. So uh, Let me get the Criterion Collection Gretel Claggett <laughs> set out, and we'll show you. Oh, but my goodness. Happy I... Hour was a bonus feature on her first, <laughs> first feature-length film. 
Right, right. Oh, from your lips, as they say, from your lips, Brandon. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. I've got a spot ready. I've got a spot ready in my collection. I'm writing up a storm, and I'm (laughs) I'm going to keep creating no matter what. (laughs) All right. Excellent. Look forward to all of it. Does this remind you of anything? Why, of course you recognize him. It's Adenoid Hinkle, the Fooey of Tomania. I bet you recognize him, too. It's Charlie, the wonderful, the extraordinary Charlie Chaplin. By a strange trick of fate, the ruthless dictator and Charlie resemble each other like two peas in a pod. Except that while Adenoid Hinkle makes millions of people tremble, Charlie makes them die of laughter. And now for the other great characters in our story. Benzino Napoloni, the dictator of bacteria. Here is Field Marshal Bismarck Heading, Hinkle's right hand. Herr Garbage, his left hand. And finally, the little barber. And Hannah, the lovely, brave Hannah. The Great Dictator is written, directed by, and stars Charles Chaplin. And joining him in the cast are Jack Oakey, Paulette Goddard, Reginald Gardner, Emma Dunn, and Maurice Moscovich. It's about dictator Adenoid Hinkle tries to expand his empire while a poor Jewish barber tries to avoid persecution from Hinkle's regime. Notable, it's Charlie Chaplin's first talkie, mm-hmm. and he while he plays the barber he wants it to be clear it's not the tramp who's behind me if you're watching this if you're listening to it i got a charlie chaplin standee behind me and they're very tramp like in it but but more nuanced i nuanced. think the tramp, I feel, right i mean more realistic right and i feel like the film kind of wants to say goodbye to the tramp at the opening because the opening is a full-on a lot of pantomime it takes place yep. in what would be World War One. We've got fake countries and conflicts going on here, but I feel like it's kind of his nod of the hat to I'm going to do other things. And it's very tramp-like. It's a lot of silent, you know, pantomime comedy was yes. saying uh, there's a lot of war stuff, but it's really impressive the war he puts together on film and he's got good model work. Like there's that huge cannon there's oh a, yeah, the cannon and, and the way the cannon follows him. Oh yeah, the whole. I mean, all of the shtick is done. It is that very kind of farcical, trampy mm-hmm. kind of. I mean, his. I guess vaudevillian type. Yeah, but mm-hmm. the, the physical humor is so brilliant. I think that your point about that. I never had thought of that, but mm-hmm. I think that's a brilliant point, Brandon. That that's kind of a nod to like okay. It is World War One, and most of the film takes place during World War Two. And the poor barber, of course, gets amnesia. So he's away and he doesn't even know World War Two is going on when he comes right. back to his barber shop. But there is that definite kind of change in tone. Mm-hmm. Even though there is some still broad humor, it's more of a detail than than force. Like a, I'm yeah. trying to think of the right word. It's more of a detail than the mission statement or something like that. It's yeah, like I know this, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. My words are. I probably said it great the last time. You did. But, <laughs> did. Well, hey, I was stumbling. I was stumbling before. You I was were like, not. We had to take a five minute break. You're like, what brilliance? <laughs> what brilliance? This guy is talking here. Oh, let's take a break. Um, like his, his comedy is there with the barber, but he's more of a straight character. And there's like a yes. different kind of comedy that comes with Hinkle when he plays him. That's still mm-hmm. Chaplin-esque, but kind of, I don't know, doing a different thing. Well, I was kind of surprised about how 
subtle and nuanced some of the humor is. I mean, you do have that broad humor, but then as Hinkle, he's got, and even the barber, I mean, he's got these things where he just throws these lines away, yeah. but they're hysterical. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, well, you know, he just kind of tosses it, but it's so funny. And he's at once funny and terrifying as Hinkle. I mean, yeah. there are some really like moments where you're like, ooh. And and I think that before we had talked about how that World War One chapter ends with the plane crashes and then yes. uh, it's it's uh, Schultz, right? It's Schultz, it's, yep. uh, Schultz who becomes he an advocate life, later yeah. Yeah, in the film. But they say, we lost. <laughs> He's yeah. like, oh. And of course, as we know, historically, when the Germans lost World War I, that sent them into a tailspin that, that then made the country and the people ripe for fascism and for a great dictator because they didn't have money to eat, because they were this war-torn country and in a great recession and you know all of mm-hmm. these problems. And so the country was ripe for someone to come in and say, I can fix this, and it's the Jews' fault. They're the ones causing the problems. And so, as we know, what happened in history. Remind me again, when was the great dictator? It was made... So it was made... I think he he started shooting it in 37 or 38, and it released in 1940. So this is well... this, This was shot, conceived before the United States entered World War II. And it's really weird, like, reading up on this and, and watch, it, like, the odd state that the the world was in just sitting and watching Nazi Germany and not, not wanting to, yeah, let's just yeah, let's let's not touch it. it. And yeah. there was people against Chaplin doing this film. Like, why are you oh, going to yeah. do that? And it, and it's really weird. Like, I, I teased earlier, David Fincher's Mank touches on kind of the personality of the time. And, there's, yep. uh, if you haven't seen Mank, there's been a lot of like, nah, Mank, but I think it's just the don't want to put my phone down crowd or maybe not into film history type crowd. But there's a brilliant scene at a birthday party in Mank where they discuss the Nazis and what's yep. going on over there casually as if it's going to go away, not be their problem or oh, that guy. Because one, they probably didn't realize the extent of what was going on over there. Yep. And they just kind of laugh it off and... I think David Fincher was brilliant into lulling people into thinking this is another Hollywood movie about making movies when he's got a lot to say uh, oh, yeah. in there that yeah. he hides. But that's one of the things is the discussion of Nazi Germany. And I was like, why does this feel like this conversation could be happening today? Oh, my gosh. With the, And then this movie has a lot of themes that sadly feel timeless. Absolutely. And, and I mean, relevant. I well and and i think that it's important for people to know or maybe they know when they listen to your podcast but mm-hmm. you asked me to pick a movie and so i grew up watching the great dictator because my father who collected 16 millimeter films mm-hmm. Would show that, and I i mean, I probably watched The Great Dictator for the first time, maybe when I was around five years old, and it was one, it became one of my favorite films. Even when I went away to college and I would come home, that was one of the films that I would request mm-hmm. for my father and I to watch. We would have a couple of movie nights with double features, right. and my dad would splice together newsreels. Oh, because yes, he remembered, so, awesome. so he would splice together newsreels of the goose stepping and the when showing scenes mm-hmm. from concentration camps. And then, of course, on the back end, we would have like Betty Boop cartoons. But in terms of The Great Dictator, I do remember when I was a little girl being fascinated with the scene where Hinkle... Well, there's that funny thing where it's not Herring, it's the other one who says, we have to get rid of the the Jews, then we'll get rid of the brunettes. And he goes, oh, the brunettes are worse than the Jews. And he says, yes, but first the Jews, then the brunettes. (laughs) And it's it's like, all all my beautiful Aryans led by a brunette. Led by a brunette. And so he builds him up and he's like, oh. You're talking about me in a way that scares me is basically what he says, but in a more clever way than I just said it. And then he says, I want to be alone, which was a, you know, kind of a nod to Greta Garbo at the time. I Mm -hmm. want to be alone. Then he goes into this fascinating kind of dream ballet as Hinkle with this globe that is like a balloon. And he's like dancing with the globe and making love to the globe. And of course it builds to a crescendo where it 
pops. But I remember as a little girl, like that scene, I was just riveted by that scene. And it's just such a brilliant piece of filmmaking. I mean, it's such a brilliant satire all the way around. Well, that globe scene is almost uh, like he was a playful child at one point. What happened? Like Exactly. And you see, I think that that's the thing is even with his Hinkle, who we all know who Hinkle is and we know right, all yeah. the horrible things. And and he does say and do horrible things in the film, but there's also very funny moments and you see this like wounded little boy. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you really do see that wounded little child and like what happened to this guy? One of my favorite comedic sequences that shows the destructive, like rapid fire life he's living is when we first get him in the office and he's doing some paperwork and he gets called and he has to go do he has to go check out a uh, bulletproof suit test that doesn't go wrong he's like and there's the great line like uh how are you? he's like it'll, it'll take two minutes you can have one and then he goes immediately to this sculptor making a bust of him and a, and a portrait and then he's got to leave that real quick and go play he like goes plays piano and then he sees a science experiment of a guy that's got a parachute hat that doesn't yes. work and does the guy jump the guy jumps and like yes. no, that didn't work oh and keep working on it which like funny people are dropping dead because <laughs> hitler was obsessed with weird things like like trying to just who cares experiments like that and we just see this okay. rotation of that and that's obviously his day-to-day life when he's not out speaking so he must love being out speaking because he's not in that and taking advantage of it but you know that's great comedy right there with just his oh yeah it's a classic and then the way that he he's able to manage these tonal shifts with paulette goddard character who does bring in more of the heart and yeah. more of you know and then the love story with the jewish barber or what about the scene with the coins where right. they're mm-hmm. eating the, the cake and he's yeah. like suspenseful d- comedy like who's gonna have the but oh, okay. and, and but it's really also reflecting on how as much as people say like, oh, I'll fight for my country when it comes down to it. They're like passing the coin like I don't right. want to put my life at risk. You know, well, like, the guys uh, in the extreme Hinkle Nazism and that's his way he knows to to do it. And he brings it upon them. And they're like, that's no way. Yeah. But- and then, of course, the ending, which is really chilling now when the barber is taken for Hinkle and Mm -hmm. has to get up and speak. And that last speech that he gives is, you know, I mean, when I watched it, I was in tears. I was in tears because it was so timely. And, and as we were saying earlier, I mean, it's even more timely now with what happened last Wednesday and what's going on in terms of things that are happening in this country that all of us, I guess, are shocked by it. I'm not surprised by it because we've been kind of leading up to this point, but like, where do we go from here? Are we going to repeat history? And of course, I mean, Chaplin was making this film, I think, to say like, hey, that speech at the end about machine men, don't be machine men. Right. And it's really an anti-fascist. It's really a deeply humanistic, like, mm-hmm. no matter our race, our religion, we're all human beings. We yeah. should help one another. We should, I mean, it's so beautifully written and so beautifully delivered. And here we are yeah. in the same place. We don't learn. <laughs> we don't, we, people love movies. They love messages like that. And then they don't, they don't take. And, but I was thinking this, like this a person, like the end speech, He's meant to be that. And he, I mean, Chaplin digs down. He gives you that look. Like, do you remember the kid at the end when he's got the like teary eye, like they're back together? And he like delves into that emotion right there that I'm like, oh, that's drawn back to that. But like, does a person like that, like, even if they give that speech or something, like, do they earn, deserve redemption? Like, that's the, do you believe them? I mean, the people. Uh, the, his opposers aren't going to be- like, are they going to believe that? Is it, does it transpire to them? We only see how it affects really his, his relationships that are on the other side of that. Right, thing, we don't, but. Well, they che- I mean, he does show that huge crowd cheering. Right. That's true. Yeah. Here. Right. That's um, true. But yeah, we don't, we don't. And, and I love the way the film ends on her in the field. And of course they know it's the barber speaking because right. it calls out, Hannah, but when she just says, listen, and he just has that beautiful close up mm-hmm. on her and she's, it's such a, again, just 
I'm getting chills. I mean, it's just such a just spot on perfect way to end the film. But you're right. We don't know how do I mean, I've been wondering when Trump came out Mm -hmm. (laughs) and gave his speech. When was it? Was it Wednesday? Was it Wednesday night? When yeah, did, it, it, I, well, no, it, it was Thursday. No, it was I Thursday. It was That's Thursday. Right. The day after, because his speech is his speech right. on Wednesday did absolutely nothing. Right. It was Thursday when he came out and said that people would be held accountable mm-hmm. and that whatever he said. Yeah, on Wednesday he was telling people to go home and that he loved them and they were special. I don't know. I have no words for that. But None. Um, yeah, uh, I just I yeah. But I wonder, and I and I haven't, I don't know if you've heard about this, but I wonder, like, how did some of his hardcore base followers react to that speech? Like, did they feel betrayed? Because he basically, he didn't take any responsibility. Well, he basically all, said, you're, you know, you. <laughs> I, I've seen it. They don't believe it. That's the, they think he was either a force or they're going deep fake. They they think it was a computer, and it's like I I believe. Oh, really? Was, Are there yeah. theories that, that? Oh yeah, they those people no? will find a conspiracy in anything, and well, the thing is, it was shown and edited in such a way that I'm like, oh, he was forced. It, it's very clear he was forced to do this, and it was multiple takes, and this is against his own will, because and. In defense of that, for me, look at his Twitter right after he went right back to saying the opposite on Twitter, and yeah, now he no longer is there. Yes, yes, but, but yeah. So, and his wasn't one of unity. It was just like, oh, yeah, no. I was bad because they said I was bad, and yeah, you know. oh no, it, I mean you can't compare it. And of course, in the Great Dictator, there's with the with the great you know all any story that has like mm-hmm. the the doppelganger you know yeah. the twins. It is the barber, not Hinkle speaking. Hinkle right. would never say that speech. I don't know. I, I I'm I'm trying to think. Are there historical figures who have really turned around, who have been one way and turned around and said, "I saw the error of my ways," or Let's give peace a chance. Let's. Yeah, I, I, I can't think of any off the. They top usually of my double head. down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And I think it's it's also, and I don't know how. You know, I don't know how we do come together in terms of. I mean, it just seems like in the United States now we have two very different realities going on, mm-hmm. and so how do we come together? And how do we how do we work together? How do we recognize each other as human beings? It's become so ugly, just the way people even talk to people, even around the COVID stuff with like I, you know, I was looking at some videos of anti-maskers in L.A. who went to the mall and the Ralphs and they were attacking people who were wearing masks and saying vile things. Oh, yeah, that was horrific at the Century City one. Yeah. And I can't believe it's happening there. Like, I know if that's not safe, like, oh, <laughs> like I'm in, mid- the, in the Midwest. I expect something like that happens somewhere. But Los but Angeles in, in Los Angeles, Beverly Hills area. Yeah. I know it was really. And that was I think that was after we did our first yep. record. Right. Yeah. Yep. And it was just really disturbing. And, you know, I mean, honestly, and, and I have kind of said this and people cringe when I say it. <laughs> But even with Donald Trump, for instance, just to harken back to Storm Chaser and kind of giving Flip Smith, mm-hmm. you know, some of those lines, and he he definitely that character kind of embodies a certain type of person with a certain type of belief system, right? Yeah. right? We all have our belief systems, but I I really think that we all do have a little bit of Trump within us. I mean, we all have archetypally and energies like we all have shadow sides we all have these things and that's the thing with a leader like a hitler or mussolini Mm -hmm. (laughs) all of these dictators or these autocrats or these when we have these extreme things i think it's because collectively our consciousness we all have that within us and it's coming up for us to kind of look at and so i have to own those parts of myself that 
Now, I'm not saying that makes it us like it, but like, I think that the only way that we can find common ground is to recognize that we are all human beings and that none of us are perfect and we all have belief systems and that we see some sort of good and also can, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's, it's like our consciousness has to shift to a place, but it gets really right. hard when it's fanaticism, when people are clinging so tightly to something yeah. And if you don't believe exactly what I believe, then you're evil or you're, you should be hung. I mean, the fact that people are calling for Mike Pence to be hung. <laughs> right. I, I don't like Mike Pence. I, I live in Indianapolis. I have, but I, I don't wish that upon the no. man. That's just, yeah, that's awful. And yeah, I think they've, I mean, these people have developed into something that isn't even the party they claim they're a part of anymore. Well, it's yeah, I think and and that's where the Lincoln Project, of course, you know, that founded by Republicans who said, like, wait a minute, I'm a Republican. I believe in this party, but this mm-hmm. is not the Republican Party. No, no, it's this it's, is this is not, you they know, they got a whole big mess on their hands. Like there's those voices and it's just the one that clicks with everybody. And then they flock to that, and that's the one that creates the movement almost. And it's it's weird, like going back to history. If you want to go back to like like Jesus Christ, yep, he was one of a many prophets down the street. He's just the one that clicked with people. I yep. historically, that's what I mean. Come at me with your religion, whatever. But historic, we'll call him historic Jesus. Yeah, that's what it was. Like there were prophets all out. And he was just the one that the words clicked and the people followed. And guess what? He was a political target. He was not popular with. Oh, oh yeah. Man, no, so, he was so, not. Yeah. He, was, he was not popular with the government. And yeah. I, I guess I don't know. I it'll be where we are in very interesting mm-hmm. times. I think the, the sad thing is that. It is history repeating itself. Right, I yeah, mean, it's right here. Know. Like, you watch a fictional film that wasn't even to the worst of World War II yet. I mean, the concentration camp in this thing is basically a penitentiary. There's yes. th- He gets letters there. You can't get... No, there were no letters. You want to mail your letter? Like, you there imagine some, no Jewish person, yeah. some Jewish person in Germany writing a letter to their concentration camp? Like, right. that's not getting delivered, and don't put your return address on it. Right. Like, yeah, it's yeah. it's yeah. Li- but he also said had he known the horrors of what was really going on, he would never have made this film. Oh, did he say that? Yeah. 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 And I mean there's stuff like even beyond Trump, there's the the stormtroopers. It's like yes. it reminded me of Black Lives Matter, the whole the problem with that going on just the way the abuse of the police system and these are soldiers. But yes. also with more recent events, these are guys that don't think there are consequences for their actions, just doing stuff, and they I don't think anything's going to happen to them. Right. And then after that war, oh crap! Oh, yep. cr- well, I was following orders. I was following Dude. orders. Yep, yep. And and, uh, and it is funny how you know Chaplin does the acting style in that they're kind of like thugs. You know, it's like that kind of. Yeah. Uh, you know, tough talking, uh, what are you going to do about yeah. it? You know, I mean, it's like... <laughs> I'm it, a German. Yeah, Come on. Yeah, I'm a German. Yeah, yeah, you, you with the badge. Yeah. And even she, when she talks back to them, she kind of gets that wise, you know, wise crack and broad voice on, mm-hmm. which is an interesting choice because it kind of contextualizes that type of brutish behavior of, you know, these little fiefdoms, you know, people, right. the sergeant who has power or in the world war one thing where they're going to check the cannon. And it, the one guy says like, check that out. And the other guy says, check that out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they pass the buck down the right. line. Go, go see about that. Uh, go see about that. <laughs> you know, nobody's going to put their ass on the line. It's no. like, oh, you do it. You're beneath me. You do it. <laughs> Because that's the thing, too, is that, yes, Hitler, (laughs) any of these leaders throughout history who were dictators, who did awful things, people followed them. And then people took that power and used it and abused it within their little community, whatever Mm -hmm. that is, whether they were in charge of a little town or, I mean, I think the last time we talked, I brought up that film, The Reader, which is based on a book. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen that film in a long time, but there is this 
just moment where you're like, oh, you know, because the lead character who Kate Winslet plays, she is brought to trial and she had been a Nazi, you know, working at a low level. As I remember, I might be remembering this incorrectly, but I believe that what her crime is, is that she locked a bunch of people in a church or Mm -hmm. a building and it was burning and she just let them burn. Mm -hmm. And so they asked her, like, why did you do that? And she said, I, I was following orders. And there's this moment where she's like, what would you have done? I mean, I was following orders and, and you see how she really had been like so brainwashed. Yeah. I mean, another great documentary, I haven't thought about this in years. Did you ever see that documentary um, blind spot about Hitler's think about his secretary? No, um, no, I did see blind spotting, which is a high recommend from me, but Oh, yes. Nothing to do with Hitler. But. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But I think it's called Blind Spot. And it's mm-hmm. it's also, a, you know, and it is a documentary, but also very chilling in terms of they interview. And of course, they're, they were very old at the time. And this Blind Spot, I'm sure, was over a decade ago. I don't remember when it came out. But, well, that's the other thing that people are talking about, too. It's like now there are Republicans kind of saying, oh, I, I think that he's not in the right mind. And of course, you have a lot of people like Stephen Colbert and mm-hmm. other people saying like, oh, just now you're figuring that right, out? Right, yeah, like, oh, yeah, now, now like, I'll jump ship now? two weeks before. Well, that's, right. that's what, what I had. What about four years of some of the things that have been going on? Well, I applaud the most social media platforms for booting him off. How mm-hmm. different is that than the all the people resigning right now and going like, oh, he's crazy now? It's like, yeah, you had plenty of stuff that could have and and you were going to probably do it after the 20th anyway. But it's like, you're the tech equivalent of these people resigning. Yeah. And what's happening, like what happens with the transition too? Like Mm -hmm. that's the other thing is like with people leaving and, and of course there have been people who were let go and replaced in the not far away past that's happened um, intentionally in terms of this transition and making sure that Biden and Harris and that administration has the proper information. I mean, right. that's been a battle. I don't know. I mean, I, I do think that anyone who hasn't seen The Great Dictator, I think that it's currently playing on HBO Max, I know, okay. it's part of that. And I'm sure you can probably get it on Prime or rent it for not mm-hmm. too much. But I, I just think like... It's on a Criterion Collection Blu-ray. There you go. There you go. It's breathtaking how timely yeah. it is and how it just resonates in in a way that I mean I still laughed out loud. I laughed uh, out loud. I cried. Right? <laughs> I, cried. I mean it's got brilliant stuff. Like they they portray like I really like one of the things I, I noticed I didn't talk about in the last one, but yeah. now you get it here in this second run. But Hinkle is idiocy is only shown within his inner circle. When he's out with people, yes. it never comes out. And yes. also he's so scary the the sound of his voice frightens me there's a scene in the village where the barber and hannah go on their first date and he comes over the pa or something and it they clear they clear yeah. the town three clears out and they're there like yeah. he's buying a flower for her and the vendor's gone right yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they gotta find hiding and all that stuff which is a nice touching point because the next time she were to hear the dictator over the megaphone is at the end when she hears the speech and it's it's mm-hmm. a resolve it's a comfort rather yes. than the fear of what they yes. had before of not having present but it was a nice little call and response there and in the first scene that we see him he's actually giving a speech and yeah. and and he's talking and and he's doing the whole applause no applause applause right. no applause you know which I found funny with, uh, I I certainly didn't model flip after that, but as you know, in that flip's opening scene, he's doing this big kind of call and repeat and like stops all the guys. Whether it be a political move or an office place. Exactly. But it does does have that feeling of, you know, kind of a rally going on. But there's that great where he starts, you know, oh, the Jordan, the Jordan, and he's spitting and and the microphone like bends. Right. Yes. Yes. He's like, like, and the microphone is like bending. I mean, that's like brilliant, you right. know. He studied terms. like footage and footage and footage of of Hitler and to mimic him, to get his vocal cadence down, everything oh. else. 
And if there's one thing that maybe dates it that a younger audience would like is the fact that he's poking fun at the German language. But yes. it's not so much he's making fun of the like an actor today would learn it and and you know be able to speak it fluently. But he's not so much making fun of the German language. He's making fun of Hitler and his yes. the way the way he talked and throwing in crazy words just because Hitler was saying crazy words. But his might be salami, Mussolini, salami, Mussolini. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, where but, they. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's it's part of that very sardonic humor. I mean, I don't think mm-hmm. he's making fun of Germans. He's making fun, like you said, of Hitler and of yeah. that. The interesting thing, too, about Hitler, I have read, it's been a while, but I have been kind of fascinated, I guess, because I grew up um, and I have, you know, I had German Jewish relatives who were in concentration camps. Mm-hmm on my mother's side and and my dad spoke German. And so that kind of Germanic, mm, you know, I've always been kind of interested in, in that and the psyche of that time. And, and Hitler, you know, there are theories that Hitler would become possessed when he would speak. Oh. Um, and if you look at some of the old newsreels and things, you know, I don't know whether this was conscious on Chaplin's part, but after he, you know, when we see Hinkle in that first scene and he's just like, you know, he's, and he's a little guy as Hitler was a little guy, but he's like larger than life and the microphone's bending and the crowd is under his control with like, you know, and then starts them applauding again with like a, you know, a little wave and then stop. But when he comes off stage, he just kind of, not collapses, but he does kind of become this very like, was that okay? You know, like this kind yeah. of, and he's got all of his, you know, his henchmen, you know, we're like, oh yes, it was wonderful. And they're whisking him away. And from accounts that I've read, apparently he would, he would almost collapse after some of these speeches. And oh. they would say that he was this different personality than when he would speak. And it was almost like he he like channeled a demon or something, you know? And if you think about it, like <laughs> actors- I got something to add to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, but I mean, if you think about it, when actors, there right. is this thing where, where you're acting, you are really channeling energies and you do kind of become possessed in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, there are different forms of possession, but, but I have read theories that people think that some people think that Hitler was actually channeling a demon, Speaking of channeling demons, I've actually heard, like, so, not my favorite person in the world. In fact, I don't. So, <laughs> I, I have a friend, Tucker Carlson. Oh. I have a friend. He's probably most one of the most liberal friends I've had in life, always been. His wife works over at Fox News. I don't know what she does, but he's met and says, he's a really nice guy off the camera and nothing like what you see on there. But when the camera comes on, evil. And that's, and he's like, and he's like, I, it's, it's a show. It's a, but to me, no, that I don't, I don't excuse that to me. What I see, that's what he's delivering to people. That's his power in life. And I don't approve of it. So even if he's nice off the camera and not, and he's just selling something and being a character. No, I, 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 I I don't think that's forgivable, but it's interesting to know that that's well, I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, even Marilyn Monroe in a in a different way would turn it on. She would say, right. like, I'm not Marilyn Monroe until but she could like in a blink of an eye become, mm-hmm. you know, she could walk down the street and not have people recognize her if she wanted. Right. And then she could just shift something energetically and crowds would be like, oh, my God, it's Marilyn. Yeah. But I, to your point, I agree. And, and this is something that I think about when I'm writing and creating is like, what's my intention and what do I want people to get from this? Because I do think, I mean, yeah, I get it. Like we all have to make money. We have to make a living. But like, yeah. what are you putting out into the world? Yeah. Right. And we are responsible for that. Right, and Exactly. I, you know, and you'll hear people say that about people in business sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. there'll be somebody who's just, uh, you know, just horrible at work and mean and nasty to people. And then they'll be like, oh, but, you know, he's he's really he's a really good dad. Yeah. 
And it's like, well, actually, we're holographic. Who we are in one thing is kind of who we are in everything. So yeah, you might show different Mm -hmm. sides, but still there is, I mean, there are splits, I guess, split personalities. We all have splits within us, but it doesn't excuse like, oh, well, but he can get away with that because he's a really good dad. Well, that's the point, like Scott Mendelson, (laughs) one of his early talking points when we were first getting to know each other, like, gosh, long ago now like maybe 15 years ago he always pointed out they always have these characters it's like oh he called them but he cries at the opera that that type of character like he's so evil but he cries at the opera and they also he's this awful guy but he loves his kids it's like one he should and that's everybody does like that doesn't get you off the hook i mean you can be a serial killer and still love your kids you're still murdering people like that's not enough to exactly. to bring it yeah. back down but like cuz cuz it's a common thing it's like oh well it's easy for people to relate to that but it's still that doesn't excuse it so no exactly well hey everybody thought ted bundy was a nice guy <laughs> you know i mean that's right yeah oh you know right. oh, have a beer a, he was such a gentleman he was so nice and you I can't mean, ask the people who didn't think so so. Exactly. They're not around to tell you. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's also this thing with excusing bad behavior. Mm-hmm. And sadly, like if we go back to the Great Recession, mm-hmm. 2008, most of those people who were responsible, never. I mean, they got away with it. And, and I think that we are at a time where, you know, I know that as of today, <laughs> impeachment papers have been filed, right? Right. We're, we're on the 24-hour Mike Pence isn't going to do anything notice. Yeah. Have we? Uh, oh, so is Mike that Pence- That's last I knew. They they were holding it off because they were giving him 24 hours to invoke right. the 25th. So, so we'll know tomorrow. Chances are he won't. No. Although I did read or hear something a little bit earlier today that it wasn't completely off the table. It w- but- well, he said he wanted to give the appearance- it was important for him to give the appearance to our allies and adversaries that our government was running and functioning. I'm like, dude, they know what's going on here. You, to show them that you would take action, to show them that it was fine, you would take action rather than trying to be a lifeboat coming to shore, convincing people the Titanic's on its way in. No, <laughs> we're not it, sinking. Yeah, yeah. We have news. Like that's one thing I think the Republican side of things has failed to notice is we are in an information age and we know things. Now we see things. We, we aren't afraid of the other hemisphere, other countries, because we have interacted with those, but we know they're not scary because they're strangers and maybe they look different than us and speak a different language. We can communicate with them via the internet and stuff. There's no mystique over a lot of things. We have records of things. We read things. People, reporters can find out more stuff without having to dig deep and they act like it's still the 1980s it's right not. you can't and that's where pence lives is mm. this it's like no we we know what's going on dude like we know you're ignoring our phone calls we know you're i've been with that man as a governor i know how he works he's very mm-hmm. old-fashioned mm-hmm. and it's no he wanted to create a news network here that he controlled <laughs> like oh. luckily that didn't happen for us yeah. but he yeah. made us quite an embarrassment for a while but yeah, so that's that's kind of how they work. But the information, but um, that's I guess that's the last I saw. That was his current stance. But yeah, I yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I, well, I mean, I think that regardless, it, it's like there you, we can't just turn a blind eye. I mean, no, that's, we can't just say he's gone in a couple just, days. Yeah, we can't we can't keep turning a blind eye. And I mean, if that happens, then it will. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I, it, I don't if know, you're. I, if you were working at Target and a guy gave us two weeks notice and then beat hit a customer in the face and then stole three TVs and a bunch of PlayStations and you're like, he's out in th- three days. Let's Yeah, let's just it doesn't matter. He's out in three days. Like, no, you can't or he told his friends to come in and do that. Right. And you know they're his friends. You know you saw him outside telling everybody to do it. That's more apt. There you go. And then you're like, oh, he's out. he's out in three days. Yeah, it's fine. We don't need to call the cops. We don't. We don't need to. We Just we can let him. Go. He's got two more shifts. Let's let him do it. No, you can't. You can't do that. We need to set a precedent. And I, I, I while it sounds like ridiculous stuff like that, it can go beyond what the replication. Uh, the he needs. There needs to be some sort of consequences dealt with. And it doesn't matter whether he's out or not. There 
things that can happen after that that are Absolutely. beneficial. Absolutely. We have to start calling things by their proper name, like mm-hmm. sedition. And keep terrorism. keep arrest keep arresting people that were there inside the cap. Uh, like maybe don't go so hard after the people outside, but get all the video and people you can that went inside. Yeah. Um, and I think they I, I think that they are doing that and my favorite is the zip tie guy said I picked him up off the ground and I was going to hand him to a police officer because I didn't know what to do with them. Wish I wouldn't have picked him up now. I'm like, oh, I didn't hear that. Right. Sure. He's like, that was the biggest mistake I made that day. Aside from being in the Capitol and yeah, yeah, like, yeah, sure. You didn't bring him in with you. Someone else is, of course, that's how you play it. Right. Mm -hmm. Man. That's a great dictator. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah. Great dictator. I put it in the masterpiece category. I think Chaplin's made a bunch of masterpieces. I think he's someone, if you're into films, you want to make films, he's one to study. Like I, him, and I think, you know, later on, uh, we've always talked, uh, I've always been a proponent of that, like that Jackie Chan is like the martial arts Charlie Chaplin. So if you're into Jackie Chan and you've never checked out Chaplin, check it out. Oh, interesting. That's an interesting, uh, that's a, that's a. was one of, that's one of Chan's biggest inspirations is, is Charlie Chaplin. Oh, and Buster, okay. like Buster Keaton yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm a bigger Chaplin fan than Buster Keaton. I mean, right. but I mean, Buster Keaton, of course, was great. Mm-hmm. But I agree with you. It is it is a masterpiece, and I think well worth the watch right now for sure because it will it will resonate it will for unsettle you. Settle you. It will unsettle you, it. and and it is funny. It's entertaining mm-hmm. as well as very informative. And as my father would always say, and of course he did not make this up, but but he would say it a lot. He would say the only thing that we learn from history is that we don't learn from history, which I keep hoping maybe one day we will. I think that we do individually, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I think that we do at times individually, in certain individuals. Right. I, I like to think that I have at times. I'm sure that there are times where I haven't. I know that there are times where I haven't because I, I think we tend that- to take giant steps back before we make a nice move forward. It tends to be like well, things see calm, like we're getting somewhere and then a huge step back and then. Whew, yeah. And- well, sadly, I, I think you're right, Brandon, that it's human nature that we have to be brought to our knees before we go like, okay, I need help. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, it's that thing of, um, so uh, yeah, we're, we're in a big step backwards right now, it seems, but I'm hopeful if we can make it through, I think it is going to be a couple of years of, I think it's going to be a rough and tumble couple no, of years. It, it doesn't end on, on Wednesday of this week that, that this episode drops. It, it absolutely no, doesn't. Not. What else? This is kind of things we've watched, read, listened to, or maybe put out in the world recently. Uh, the essay, something we're working on, yep. anything like that. So Gretel, what else? Well, I've just, I really kind of had my head down writing. It's kind of a metaphysical thriller, which is something that's very different for me. So I, I've been working on that. I've been reading a lot about conspirituality, how there are these groups of mm-hmm. kind of new age people who, you know, with QAnon and things like that, right. that it's not just far right, that there's actually a far left a uh, population who really see Trump as a light worker and mm-hmm. who are really following, you know, these. So there, so there's been some interesting stuff written about conspirituality and about narcissism in the New Age principles. Now that doesn't mean mm-hmm. that everyone who follows New Age or who's spiritual, as a actually I had a friend who used to say spiritual. She liked to say the word that way. Spiritual. I'm spiritual. Um, spiritual. I'm trying to think like I, you know what I did actually, I did end up binge watching Russian Doll again. Oh yeah, that's a good one. And it's only four hours, but it's so good. It's so good. And in alignment with like very different than the Coen brothers, but in alignment with the great dictator and and these things where dealing with like tough subject matters, but with, Mm -hmm. with humor I'm trying to think what else. I mean, of course, I've been watching the news and, you know, just trying to make sense of of everything that's being thrown at us Last right now. week was like, welcome back, election wa- uh, watchers from exactly. uh, election exactly. week. 
Yeah. Yeah. And happy 2021. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Right, we're back. Yeah. So what uh, what else for you, Brandon? What's well, going on? Uh, my one thing I want to touch on is I recently this past weekend, I watched the movie Duel, which is Steven Spielberg's first film. It was a television movie. But I decided, like, I, I, w- I, had a, I had a hell of a week. I put it in Friday night, and I passed out to it. And so I was like, the next day, I was like, you know what? I'm going to show this to my son. I'm going to show him Duel. Because he has seen the Indiana Jones movies and yep. Jaws and Jurassic Park. I actually, fun thing, the first weekend when we were on lockdown, I uh, wanted to do something fun, so I had a little film festival for them, and I did nice. uh, four movies, and I made tickets, I made a poster with times that they started, and uh, made snacks to go with each, and had pizza at the end of the night, oh, and goodness. what did I show through that? Uh, the first one, oh, Hard Day's Night, They lo- I, this was... That was a like roll the dice. They loved it. It was one. I love that film. Oh my goodness, I love that film. They love it. They like the Beatles a lot. So I was like, let's show them a movie with the Beatles. And they, my wife was not that into it, and she was just bemused at how the kids were like loving it. And then it was, I I think I I went animated. I showed them American Tale, the five old movie from my my childhood. And then I, I showed them Moonrise Kingdom. The oh, Wes Anderson yeah. one. I was like, I yes. think I, because they like Fantastic Mr. Fox. So it's uh-huh. kind of quirky. And that one's all, you know, all ages. My wife loved it. She had never, I can't believe she didn't see that one. I, I go to the theater alone. <laughs> so I maybe didn't take yeah. it. But, and I'm a Wes Anderson fan. Oh, yeah. I, I also like, I mean, I don't love all of like Moonrise Kingdom. I have mm-hmm. to check that out again. Uh-huh. It wasn't one of my favorites of his, but. I just respect the fact that he just like he has such a he's got his own th- yeah. singular voice, and right. so I always want to see what he's doing. But oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, and then the finale it was Jurassic Park, and uh-huh. that one that one frightened them. They were like they're they're eight and six. Okay. And I was ask. Okay. She yeah. was five, so she was five when this happened because her birthday's in May, and they were. It was affecting. She's like, "Why did you?" I'm like, "Cause I wanted them to watch it when it would, you know, have that effect on them." Yeah. And I'm like, "She's like, why do you do that?" I'm like, "Cause, you know, they're gonna they're gonna chase that. They're gonna chase that feel. They're gonna get a little older. They're gonna watch it again. It's not gonna be as effective, but they're gonna want to find the next thing like that. You have to have that experience, and that's a safe yeah. one to do that with. And I thought it was safe because I showed him Jaws a couple of years before that. My daughter loved Jaws. My son was kind of like Ugh, blood. So then I brought it back to Duel. I'm like, you should see the first movie from this guy, and he he liked it. He thought it was pretty he, pretty effective. My daughter came down like a little a ways maybe after the first act, and uh-huh. she was drawn into it. And mm. then she got tired and was like, I'm going to bed. What is this on an app? I'm like, no. I was like, I looked up uh, because she has, she just got a TV in her room. And I was like, no, it's, it's, uh, I looked up, it's not, but I'm like, I, it's a Blu ray we're watching. She's like, can, can I borrow it? Cause I, I really want to see the end of it. And she was, Aww. she was like into it. I was like, wow. So watching, I'm just like amazed at how already there the guy is for one. And that movie is a TV movie with, giant movie camera angles cuts mm. everything else and it's just so if, if he makes a chase go the whole film effectively and my son was like wow you never really found out who the guy in the truck was and i was like that's the point that's how scary it is you never you never know and it's not about that he's like well i didn't you know that guy didn't the main character didn't know much i'm like well he started out you remember that phone call he had with his wife He's like, yeah. She and I go. He was talking to his wife. They had a fight the night before because they had a party, and one of their friends harassed her, and he didn't stand up for her, for her, and that was part of the fight. Like, yeah, I'm like, and you notice he's kind of put offish the whole movie, and then he finally learns to stand up for himself at the end when he goes again. He decides to quit chasing and goes after the truck guy. He's like, oh yeah. I was like, yeah. so. So he, he got it. He got so it he, there. I had to, I had to throw it and there. But he, so he's six and your daughter's he's eight. eight. He's eight and my oh, daughter's he's eight. six. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. but I decided to throw Duel on and I was like, all right. Cause I hadn't seen it in a few years, probably since the Blu ray came out. And I was like, I just felt like, I don't know why I felt like throwing on Duel. Yeah. But... I've never seen that film. I have to oh, check you it. Oh, no, yeah. I... So, it's his, it's his um, first movie. It's available to like rent and stuff. She was my daughter was asking if it was on one of the free streaming apps because right, right. She, she's got her new TV. Don't mess with her. Uh, yeah, but yeah. but yeah, do I have a godson who's seven mm-hmm. and his yeah. brother 
and I'm Auntie Gretel to both of them, uh, both of them, and his brother is nine. So very, very close in age gotcha. to, yeah. to to your children. And it is funny because it's like they like. I I understand what you're saying about the Jurassic Park because mm. like ooh, my godson who's seven, he's really getting into reading graphic novels. Like mm. he had Dracula, okay. and I got him for Christmas. I got him Frankenstein, and they like scary movies, but he'll get too scared at times. Ah, okay. And, but then he'll say like, oh, no, it's scary. But like, I mean, it really freaked me out, but in a good way. <laughs> yes, exactly. No, you have to. Like, that's what got me. That's what got me. Like, yeah. one of the things like that made me so passionate about the film and stuff is the way it would make me feel. And being a horror yeah. person, that's like a drug that you never you're searching for that high again. And you, you do find it at times in different places. But, you know, now that now that I'm going to be going to be 39 I more appreciate the craft and the intention yes. more so than it does scare me. Um, yeah. And I, I talk to a lot of people. Oh, it's scary. I was scared. I'm like, how old are you? The world is what's scary to you now. Like no. that's no. life is what's scary. So life is good. scary right now. I love that you're sharing films and your passion for films. Oh, yeah. I, and I like to give them a well. Like I don't want them to grow up thinking like uh-huh, old. And because my parents kind of got that way. I'm like, you grew up with that, and you like laugh, but like. I, I want them to have. A, I want them to see practical effects. I want them to see like old puppetry, and I want them to see CG, and I want them to see like everything, so they can just understand the heart of like storytelling and different ways, and not be afraid because something's in black and white. Like I shown them Chaplin. They like Chaplin. Like I showed them Chaplin in the Marx Brothers early age, and the okay. univer- Universal Classic Monsters. Like I, they love the Classic Monsters. Those have been my son since he was like three, because I always make a tradition after trick or treating. Uh-huh. Uh, we come back and I show him a new horror movie he hasn't seen. Oh, I love I kinda, that. And I kind of raise the bar every every year on him. And the one one year I showed Frankenstein, but the the grave robbing at the beginning freaked him out. So I I said, okay, we will we will stop it. He's like, but I want I want to watch we want it. So I put in Dracula, love Dracula. So that yeah. one. Um, but then he went then he went back to Frankenstein after Dracula, and then he got all into them. So he's into yeah. those. He's into, and he's got his own stuff too that I. I don't understand. I hate that. I'm like, I'm going to be a dad that understands this stuff. I'm like, I don't like that. <laughs> I know. I, I, it's not for me. I know. I, I, I know. My boys, as I call them, yeah, they'll ask me, have you seen, you know, have you seen this? And I'm like, what? I, I don't even know what they're talking about sometimes. Right. Um, oh, I have to share a funny thing that um, mm-hmm. I think it was on New Year's Day. I found, okay. found out on New Year's Day that Storm Chaser like, got first place dramedy at the New York Women in Film and Television short festival. And I won Best Writer and Director, which was lovely. Uh, it was a great way to start 2021. It's such hard work, as you know, mm-hmm. and you have to overcome so many challenges that when you kind of get like a Hey, good job. Keep going. You know, it means a lot. Yeah. So I was talking, wishing them a happy new year. And and then I said, oh, I have some good news, you know, and I told them about the award because they think it's really cool that I write and direct. And yeah. I actually Well, shot. it is cool. So yeah. <laughs> don't, don't they don't think they know. Yes. Yes. So, and they both, I mean, they love movies. They love mm-hmm. movies. And I think that Owen definitely has a proclivity. I think that, you know, he might, he might want to act and direct down the road. I mean, he's very, he, and he remembers movies verbatim and he'll act out scenes. So we've made some little home movies and stuff, but Luke says to me, he goes, so Auntie Gretel, um, wait a minute, how long is Storm Chaser again? And I said, oh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's about 28 minutes. And he goes, oh, he goes, so really you're like a director in training. <laughs> Uh, well, not if Storm exactly, Chaser gets two but, more awards. They'll let me make something that's forty minutes, exactly. and then after that, I get and, and, fifty. Yeah, and and Fabiola was like, "No, your auntie Gretel is a director. She's a writer and director." She goes, "Luke, feature films are a lot of money to make. Like, you right. know, films takes money. So, like, you know, we 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 gotta <laughs> gotta." find somebody to fund her feature, you know, but it was just so funny. Cause he just said, you know how kids are. I mean, he's like, mm-hmm. so really you're like a director in training. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have my training wheels. There They're like, 
you know, because he recently got a bike. Well, actually, for Christmas, he got a bicycle okay. without training wheels. So he finally oh. he he was able to ride a bike. So they got him a new bike. But yeah, so I'm I'm in the process of getting my directing training wheels off right now. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's good. And once you get your training wheels off, I can't wait to see what what comes of yes. that. <laughs> But that'll do it for today on this episode. And Gretel, when I say, today, when I say thank you, it weighs like a ton because not only is it like a, a joy to share time and film with you, but to come back and redo something we already did with like no hesitation and more enthusiasm. Like that's just amazing. Like that doesn't, Aww. that doesn't happen. That does, someone's like, let's do this again. I've been there before. <laughs> this isn't my first rodeo with having yes. to re-record. Yes. And like, thank you. Like that's. Well, just thank you. I mean, awesome. I absolutely, I love talking with you and I, I would love to come back again down the road. Sure, yes. and, yeah. And thank you. Thank you for, for all of your, great insights and for your support of me and storm chaser. I, I do really appreciate it, Brandon. Hey, thank you. No, keep, keep putting out great stuff. Like uh, you keep getting the support, even if you don't No. All right. So where can people keep up with you around the internet, social medias? Ah, yes. Social medias. So I'm on Facebook, Gretel Claggett. And Instagram, Gretel Marlena it was actually named after Greta Garbo and Marlena Dietrich, my nice. dad's two favorite actresses, both also German. Uh, so yeah, Insta is Gretel Claggett and Twitter I'm not on as much, but that's at Gretel Claggett as well. And then- um, Neither is Donald yeah. Trump. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I have not been banned though. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have you know. At there least you go. Not. And then my website is my name, Gretel Claggett, G-R-E-T-L-C-L-A-G-G-E-T-T dot com. <laughs> all right. Excellent. <laughs> my email. Yeah. Gretel Claggett dot com. So you can find links to all of, you know, to Happy Hour, to Flip the Switch, to Storm Chaser and, and some other work. And if anyone wants to shoot me a line, there is a contact. You can email me through that gotcha. site. Excellent. And I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Brandon4KUHD. My written work is at RiceSoBlue.com. There's more from the Brandon Peters Show this week. But until then, always remember to keep the positivity in your online film chatter. Thank you for listening. The Brandon Peters Show is a Creative Zombie Studios production. Produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters. Written and edited by Brandon Peters. Announcer vocals by Jessica Olsman. Theme song by Metavari. Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. Additional information on this and other episodes at brandonpetersshow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at brandonpetersshow.com. The show is available on Apple Music, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found. until we have a pure Aryan race. How wonderful. Tolmania, a nation of blue-eyed blondes. We're not a blonde Europe, a blonde Asia, a blonde America. A blonde world. And a brunette dictator. Dictator of the world.